Welcome back to another one of our online Sundays. Today we're going to be considering the theme of membership. Today down at the church we're going to be bringing in a number of folk, about 10 folk, into membership of this local church. And so we thought we'd talk a little bit about what membership is. Uh, what does it mean? What are the implications of becoming a member of a local church? And obviously specifically for us, what does it mean to become a member of this local church? We're going to look at a, a few principles uh, when we look at that and from the earliest days of the church the first days of the church and when i say church i don't mean small c this church but i mean capital c the church there have been gatherings of people mostly it seems small gatherings uh, but in the uh, in the new testament we know that the the books that we have the individual books that have been written that collectively make up the new testament for us fall into certain categories we start off with the gospels of matthew mark luke and of course john four different books that have been put together we call them the gospels that tell us about the life of jesus luke says that many have undertaken to write about the life of jesus and i don't know how many many is but probably more than four, but we've got four of them here. And in, in, the, in these books, they have recorded the events, the teachings that surrounded the person of Jesus. Andy Stanley has a very good way of illustrating the impact that Jesus made. You see, at the time of Jesus uh, living in Israel, Israel were under the occupation of, a, of Rome. And Rome had an empire that was vast. It, was, um, it had an army that was impressive. And of this impressive empire with this impressive army, this, um, uh, this impressive time of history, when people look through history, the, the empire of Rome is what marks out one of the periods of history. There would have been someone who sat at the top of all of this, a Caesar who sat at the top of all of that. He would have been the most important person at that time. But at the same time, in this backwater country that was occupied by Rome, in the backwater town of this backwater country, there was born a boy and he grew up to be a man and he grew up to be a carpenter. And ultimately he was going to hang on a cross and he was going to be resurrected. And if I was to ask you who that person was, no doubt you'd all be shouting at the screen, his name is Jesus. I would imagine though, if I was to ask you the next question, if I was going to ask you who was the guy that was the most important person at that time of this impressive empire, of an impressive army, of this impressive period in, in, the, in 
the history of this world. If I was to ask you who the emperor was at that time, who was the Caesar, what would you say? Curious, isn't it? That we remember a carpenter from Nazareth in Galilee, but we struggle to name the who was emperor at that same time. If you're playing it long at home, it was Caesar Tiberius. So Jesus made this amazing impact. And since then, we've had groups of people that would call themselves disciples of Jesus that gather every week um, around the world. There'll be gathering sizes that will number into the thousands to just a few people. They will meet in cathedrals and churches and warehouses and shops and homes and next to rivers and under trees. And in these gatherings, Jesus didn't give explicit instructions as to what was to take place in these gatherings. But rather we see some instructions which are given a little bit later in the New Testament. And for that we have epistles. And in these epistles, many of them were written to a local church. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And then there were some that weren't written to a local church. They were written to local people, uh, Titus and 1 and 2 Timothy. But even in those letters that were written to these people, they were written with instructions about how churches were to be and to conduct themselves. So the, whether they were the pastoral epistles or the epistles that were written to speci specific churches, they were written in order for people to know what goes on in the life of a local church. They were to instruct them on the proper function of a local church. But not only those. In Revelations chapter 2 and or Revelation chapter 2 and 3, there are letters from Jesus to seven local churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamum, Philadelphia, and of course Laodicea. So there is much written about how a local church is meant to be with one another. Our text today highlights that and is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. I'm writing these things to you now, even though I hope to be with you soon, so that if I am delayed, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. Before this moment in that letter, Paul had been writing about leaders and what characteristics leaders should have and fruit that leaders should have in their lives. Before that, there was an instruction about what worship should look like. Before that, there was an instruction to Timothy about what he should do. And before that, there was warning about false teachings. So these are all instructions about how a local church might work. In our text, we have this. If I am delayed, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This wasn't a, a thing that a, a universal thing that was Paul was saying that overall the church in the whole world needs to look like this. But it was written to a specific congregation. It's written to our congregation to say each local church should have these characteristics. And so when we organize a local church or a local congregation, a local gathering of people, there are certain principles, but within that, there's a tremendous freedom around how these principles get worked out or played out in a local church. And no church has a monopoly on the truth on this, that each of us have a way of expressing it. And they, these are legitimate expressions of that. For us as a Baptist church, one of the things that we have is church membership. This is a mechanism that we have in order to help us govern a church well. And so... Within this idea of membership, there are certain thoughts which will be contained in of, inside of it. So in committing to a membership, there are there is implied within that a commitment to belonging, a commitment to knowing others, and of course to being known. So in other words, I guess it's to be engaged with a group of local believers. I wonder if you noticed that it was called a household of God. And we know that households don't just happen. There needs to be some degree of planning. Bills need to be paid. Bins need to be taken out. Dishwashers need to be emptied. Clothes need to be laundered. Uh, we, we, cooking needs to happen. Can you imagine if you never knew who was going to be sitting around your dinner table? Do you cook for one or two or six or 20? Who would know? So there needs to be a, a way of organizing things so we know. We don't want to cook too much food or too little food. We need to make sure that you know, dishes are clean, clothes are washed, and there is a general good running of a household. 
And so there is a structure which is put around a household in order to make it function. And for us as a local church, membership is one of those structures that helps us with the organization and how we do things. So on a day like today, there is a church meeting immediately after our service this morning. And we get to make decisions about this local church at a meeting like that. And so it's important for us as a group of local believers who belong to this local church, we come together to discern the mind of Christ to talk about certain things. And today we're talking a little bit about spending some money, about some of our ministries and how things are going to look. And together we get to make those decisions. These are serious matters we'll be looking at and they are worthy of our time. But we recognize that when we make decisions as individuals, but especially I suppose in this context as a group of local believers, we're making decisions not just for now, but decisions which will impact the future of this local church. We're meeting on Sundays and we meet in an auditorium and this auditorium was built by those who started the church 45 years or so ago. And they did that for their benefit. They benefited from having a place to meet and together, but they didn't only do it just for their benefit. They did it for the benefit of generations of people who are yet to come. And I am one of those people and you are as well. And so the benefit that we have was because of a decision that people took all of those years ago. And similarly for us, we make decisions now that we will feel the impact of those decisions, I hope, but also generations to come will feel the impact of that decision. At our recent Leadership Council meeting, um, Albert reminded us of the legacy question when it comes to making decisions. And it was brought up around a, a church plant that we might be able to be a part of in China, but there is those there is the legacy question about decisions that we get to make together, which will impact our local church, our local area with the gospel um, of Jesus. And so these are important things. And membership is a mechanism that helps us do that. Because those who are members, it includes them in a way that non-members aren't included. Non-members get to be part of the discussion. But the way that our structures work, it's the membership that ultimately gets to make these decisions. So Paul calls it a household, then he calls it a church of the living God. And the word church is a common Greek word. It's used repeatedly throughout the New Testament. You would have heard this, I'm sure, a hundred times before, but it is that word ecclesia, which means gathering. It's a gathering of people. So what is implied here with calling it this ecclesia, this gathering, what is implied for a local church would be that one of our commitments in becoming members and belonging to a local church is a commitment to gather. We know that gathering can look like lots of different things and different ways in different places, but still the thought of gathering remains. Some have music and others don't. Some will use silence more and others less so. Some will have long sermons, others not quite so much. Some will use bells and smells and others won't have that at all, but all will gather. The context may determine what that gathering needs to look like or how many can gather. Or maybe pandemics get to determine how many can gather. In England, uh, in England it used to be that the, the start time of many churches were de was determined about what time the milking of cows concluded. I know that there was one church that start time was dictated by what time a local train had rolled into the station and it's the church started a few minutes after that. So context might determine when and how we gather. Sometimes government's restrictions for political reasons will determine it. Sometimes for medical reasons will determine it. So we don't have only one way of doing it, but we get to work it out in our local circumstance. For us, we are free together. Our churches are not targets for attack. We don't have to keep the noise down for fear of who might hear. And we can come in confidently saying, Jesus is Lord. In fact, in our local congregation, very often there will be a prayer which is prayed, thanking God that we are able to gather. Paul says this is a church of the living God, or this is a gathering of the living God. And so here today in our local church, a gathering of the living God. God. So there's something special happens when we gather. Something significant happens. There's an oft-used Bible verse, and it 
in fairness, it's often used when not many people turn up, but we get reminded of this, that where two or three, two or three are gathered in my name, says Jesus, there I am in the midst. But repeatedly in the New Testament, we learn of how we are the body of Christ, how he is our head. So in membership, part of our commitment is to gather, not as a rule that needs to be obeyed, but as a desire that is in our hearts. In practical terms, we gather on a Sunday. And one of the things that we'll be talking about actually at the church meeting today is whether we should have one service or two. But still, the question really is around how we gather. There's a well-known verse from the book of Hebrews that reminds us of this. It says this, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I can tell you in some circles there's a push to saying that churches generally are too Sunday-centric, that we focus too much of our time, effort, and resource on a Sunday morning. And whether, we, um, whether that's true of our church or not, well, we could have a discussion about that. But as a local church, we tend to be reasonably active out in the community around us. One of the ways that we're active is with our housing trust. And for that, I've got Gordon coming up next, just to give you a little bit of news about one of the projects that we're currently working on. So here's Gordon. Kia ora, folks. Uh, behind me, you see the property that's the Bays Community Housing Trust are developing to, and putting on uh, three, uh, two three-bedroom houses, two two-bedroom and two one-bedroom uh, dwellings. Um, they've struggled through wet weather to get to this stage and it will be completed. The ground works within a month. What we're pausing to do today is celebrating and giving thanks for this stage we've reached. And why are we giving thanks? We're giving thanks for the prayers of the people of God at Long Bay, for our housing trust and this venture, which has had to overcome many challenges, and God has been overcoming those. What we've seen is now uh, government stepping up to provide us with the level of subsidy that's required to sign a contract with a uh, building firm for building those houses. Uh, we're also thankful for uh, Christian Savings who have uh, granted us the loan money to make it happen and the contract now has been let and the houses will be completed by November next year. So we're celebrating and giving thanks to God for all that has been accomplished thus far and will be accomplished over the next year. So kia ora folks, thank you. So it's great news about our housing trust and the progress that has been made and the contracts that we've been able to sign. But we recognize that what we do out in the community, whether it's with housing or, or whatever ministry we happen to be involved with, that when we gather, it helps us to make sense of why we do what we are doing. It helps to invigorate us to do what we are doing. So then when we gather, uh, sometimes there's songs to be sung, aided by musicians. Thank you to our musicians and singers who help us in that way. There are prayers prayed, there's conversations had, there's sermons preached. We get to encourage one another in our faith and in our lives. And that encouragement comes by being together and engaging with one another. Having a, a folk around creates a good atmosphere for us to be a part of. And we get to have this encouragement one for another. And sometimes our mere presence brings out encouragement. And sometimes it is done very specifically and very deliberately. There is one lady in our congregation, actually there's, there's more, but there's one particularly, who comes to me on a Sunday morning and she asks me how I'm doing. And she means it very sincerely. And so I'm really happy to tell her about how things are going in my life, but she checks in on me and she continually checks in on me. And just the act of checking in with me is an encouragement to me. So as a congregation, and I'd say especially true of church members, is that there is a, an expected way, as Paul writes here, that we are to be with one another. We are told that God looks at our hearts and he does look at our hearts. And with that, there is an expectation that with Jesus in our heart, it leads us into being a certain way with one another. Someone once wrote that we are called to be friends with God and with one another. And for that, God has given each one of us gifts. And those gifts that he's given to us are not for the benefit of the individual to whom the gift has been given, but it's for the benefit of the congregation. 
In Ephesians we read, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. In Corinthians, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. In 1 Peter 4, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. The local church is a place that has been ordained by God to give the necessary structures that believers need in order to build one another up, to have accountability with one another, and to contend with our, in our faith together and to proclaim God to this world. So part of our commitment and membership is to use our gifts for the benefit of others. Now, Timothy was in Ephesus when Paul wrote this to him, and Ephesus had the temple to Artemis, or Diana, and um, one of the features of this temple were its pillars. There, it, it, there were 127 of these pillars, and every one of them apparently was a gift of a king. These were amazing pillars. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. And they're made of marble, they're studded with jewels, they're overlaid with gold, so the people of Ephesus knew what a beautiful thing a pillar could be. And it may be, um, and it may be that the idea of using the, the, the pillar, the, as Paul refers to pillar, uh, the church as a pillar here, was not so much as a, as a buttress, but as a display. You see, often on the top of pillars, we can see significant men or women from history that they stand out above these ordinary things, clearly to be seen even from a distance. And for us as a local church, at the instruction of Paul here, is that we uphold the truth. And we do that in such a way that people can see it. So we're called to uphold a truth, and we're called to do that in a world where truth seems to be constantly changing. And yet we know that there are some constant and some unchangeable truths seen most obviously in the person of Jesus, when he said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we uphold Jesus. This is part of the work of a member of a local church. His intent was that now, and Paul writing, through the church, and this isn't to the church at Ephesus, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So through the church, and again it's that word ecclesia, through the gathered, that through our lives with one another, that the manifold wisdom of God would be on display. So those who are part, committed to a local church, that in our gathering together, in our being this local church, that our commitment to one another, that we will... Um, we will show the wisdom of God. And we, our prayer, our hope, our desire is that people get to see that in increasing measure. That always we want to lift Jesus high. And then he said that he would draw people to himself. So then our membership commitments, commitment contains within it the commitment to gather, the commitment to serve, the commitment to share our gifts, the commitment to uphold truth. And through doing all of that, to make God known in the place where we are. So I think membership's a really good thing. So it's going to be a great joy to bring these folk into membership with us here this morning. And if membership is something that you've been thinking about, or now it's been prompted you to think about it, then maybe give us a call. Uh, we can have a sit down and have a chat through it uh, and bring you into membership into this local church. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you as ever that we get together. Sometimes it's online, sometimes it's in person, always in the name of Jesus. And we pray that as we gather, as we are defined as this local church, this local gathering of believers, that our commitment to one another is something which will shine a light on, on Jesus himself. That the way that we are will display this manifest wisdom of God to the world that is around us. And so in all that we do, as we gather on a Sunday, as we go out in various ministries and various homes and sports teams and workplaces throughout the week, that all that we do, the way that we do it, the way that we conduct ourselves will be a, a testament, a, a testimony to Jesus and shine a light on him, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so as ever, Father, we commit ourselves to you today 
praying that the Spirit of God will continue to work in us and through us, all for the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.